look, between the age of eight and 18, I probably watched 500 games of football in person in the stand, you know, and, and that has an impact how you view the game, how you see the game. You you see the game in a much more total picture yeah. rather than just what the TV cameras want to show you. And yeah. so and then the ability, like I said, to interact with not just other other supporters who are seeing the same picture as you, but also, you know, players, uh, coaching staff, and then to get involved. Look, I grew up at distillery. I think I did basically every job apart from being on the first team coaching staff, you know, I was working in the mini soccer centers. I was down helping you guys out a little bit at the academy for a short while. You know, I sold the programs. I helped line the pitch. Lord, even when I was at university, I came back one summer and, and put together the club's UEFA um, playing license in order to allow to play in Europe. One, I think I did every job possible at that club, um, bar one or two. And that's an experience I just don't think you can get at a bigger organisation. Maybe you have to pinch yourself sometimes when you think about it. The boy of 15 years old that started coaching in Lisbon in Northern Ireland at mini soccer, that probably within a 12-year time frame would end up being an international manager. You know, it's, it's, this is a wonderful story, and we're going to go bit by bit for this, because I'm really excited to cover that. I mean, the next, I suppose, milestone then was that you were named Man United Grassroots Coach of the Year in 2006, informed me that they'd selected me as their sort of coach of the year, their grassroots coach of the year, and invited me and one of the, I think one of the families that had nominated me from the club to come up to Old Trafford. And we sort of got given the sort of VIP treatment um, at, at Old Trafford. You know, we got a box for a game against Middlesbrough. I think it was like Easter Monday, yeah. or maybe it was Bank Holiday Monday sort of in May time. I can't remember. It was towards the end of the season. It was against Middlesbrough. It was a 0-0 draw. It was the worst game of football you've ever watched. Um, <laughs> but, um, it, uh, but we got invited out at half time to, um, to meet uh, Sir Bobby Charlton. Oh, wow. um, was presenting me with the award on the field at half time on the halfway line. And so, but it was really interesting. When again, look, I'm 20 years old at the time and you're stood in Old Trafford. Obviously, everyone I think knows at Old Trafford, the players come out from the corner. Yeah. But if you go back and watch the old videos from the sort of 50s, 60s and 70s, the players come out at the halfway line. Now that tunnel is still at Old Trafford. Yeah. And that old tunnel from the 60s and 70s. So you're waiting in that tunnel to come out to the halfway line. And you sort of, for me, it probably hasn't changed much in many, a few decades. And I remember thinking, you know, this is the type of place that, you know, Harry Gregg, George Best, you know, et cetera, would have lined up and yeah. walked out. So that's sort of a moment of realization. And then, you know, I'm sort of told, right, it's your time to walk out. But as I'm walking out of the tunnel, is the same moment they're announcing Sir Bobby Charlton to the supporters. Now, obviously, you can imagine the reaction Sir Bobby Charlton gets, you know, <laughs> from the Manchester United supporters. But it just it's the same moment that I'm walking out. So you get this, you know, raucous applause, clearly not for me, but for <laughs> Sir Bobby. Um, but it's still, it's that moment to walk out into that arena you know, with 50, 60,000 people, you know, on their feet cheering as you walk onto the pitch to meet, you know, one of the all-time legends of the game and receive an award from him. And, but again, that's that moment. You get those little moments, Tim, and you think it's like a drug. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's that, you know, to be in that sort of theatre and be sort of received with that sort of, you know, just atmosphere, you think, yeah, this is where you want to be. And look, I've got the greatest respect for all of the coaches who work in academy football and I've worked in academy football. But for me, there's something that always draws me back to that arena. And it's little moments like, um, like that, that you think, yeah, I want to be here. This is what I want. I want 50,000 people critiquing what my team are doing um, for the positives and the negatives. And, but yeah, it was, it was an incredible uh, thing. Um, Amazing. And, I mean, that, what an experience. Yeah. 20 years old, walking out of the Theatre of Dreams, Old Trafford, to receive your award of Sir Bobby Charlton, as you say, the legend of the game. I just sort of thought, look, they're looking for a caretaker coach, if you want to call it that, for these last three qualifiers. I just felt, look, get me in the room. Because if that's what they're looking for, it's low risk for them. Um, I'm a domestically based coach. I felt I was the best coach living in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. 
And I just felt, get me in the room. And and we managed to set up, you know, a meeting with the with the country's fe- football federation, with the hierarchy, mm-hmm. country of sport. And um, we put together a presentation, both on how I felt the, um, the national team could develop in the years to come, but also how we could win the very next game, which was at home to Tunisia. Yeah. And um, we went and presented. And yeah, a couple of days later, they came back and said, look, we really liked what we heard. We'd like to offer you the job on this three-game basis. Amazing. Look, that was right time, right place. It was the scenario meant that it was low risk for them because, look, 90% likelihood they're not going to qualify for the World Cup anyway. So what risk is it to give it to someone maybe a bit different? Yeah. Um, also, it met their requirement of maybe being lower budget because I already lived in the country. Yeah. I also knew the team already. So, you know, the stars aligned a little bit and it was right time, right place. I'm not That's naive awesome. enough to think that had I been sitting in Belfast or New York applying for that position, would yeah. I have got that job? No, yeah. I would not have got that job. But I was in the right time, right place. And, and look, but I also think I was ready. Um, I was confident. I, I, I believed in my coaching abilities. Um, and so I, I say to a lot of people, whether it's players or coaches, that you don't, you don't get to pick when the opportunity is presented to you, but you do get to be prepared. You know, you just basically, you know what your opportunity, what opportunity do you want to come along at some point and prepare yourself for it so that when it does drop in front of you you're not scrambling that you're okay you might be a bit nervous you might have the butterflies in your stomach about it if it comes a bit earlier than you expected Mm -hmm. but if you are prepared then then you're prepared um there's an old saying that says you know people rise to the occasion you've Mm -hmm. heard that one before yeah people don't rise. people don't rise to the occasion people rise or fall to the level of their training and preparation if you're not prepared for the occasion, you're going to fall short 99 <laughs> times out of 100. So you don't rise to the occasion. You rise or fall to the level of your preparation. And so for me, I felt I was prepared. And, and yeah, it was, it was a great opportunity. And really, it was a moment that kick-started my professional career. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, and, and tell us this. That, so the first game, you'll know, paint us this picture, 27 years of age, you know, the youngest head coach in international football going into that game at Tunisia. I mean, how many supporters was there? How was your feeling at the game? How did how did the game go? Um, well, actually, before I even get to the game, do you know what? Prior to that, I've been coaching from the age of 15, 16 to 27, Tim, and I never used a whistle prior mm-hmm. to that. Um, I always I can whistle through my teeth, and I always used to do that. You know, I would, um, I never are, you'd shout stop and stand still. I would never, I had never owned, I don't think, a football whistle. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I went and coached Sierra Leone. And the first training session, we used to train inside the National Stadium. And they said to me before, oh, do you want the stadium open or closed? And I always thought, I've got this thing about make the players understand what it means to the public. And um, I said, no, it's okay. Have it open. We're not, you know, it's the first day of training. We're not going to be doing anything groundbreaking on the first day of training. Have it open. Mm-hmm. Um, there was about 17, 18,000 people turned up <laughs> um, for, for this open training session. It's... And I could not hear myself shout, let alone the players on the field hear it. And so I bought a football whistle after that. Um, <laughs> and ever since, I've used the whistle to coach. Um, but, yeah, so it wasn't – yeah, and then the game, I think there was about 40,000, 38, for whatever. The, the, the stadium was full. It was a home game. It was a full full crowd, about 40,000 people in the stadium. Um, and But, yeah, that first training session where you're – you're going out and running a training session and you've got, yeah, about 17, 18,000 people in the stadium watching you train was, again, one of those moments that you suddenly realise, you know, it's like, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, sort of moment. <laughs> and, and, yeah, but, again, that's great because it, 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 it lets you know how much it means to people. 
if it's if, if it's ever needed, you know, it gives you extra motivation. Look, this is important. It's important on a level that you maybe don't appreciate when you're sat in your office designing your sessions. And um, and so yeah, we came to the first game, full stadium. Uh, we did. We ultimately really needed to win. We'd never beaten Tunisia in our history. At half time, we were one nil up. Um, they then got a penalty earlier in the second half, made it one one. We then went two one up with about thirty minutes to go, and then in the ninety first minute, a bit of a goal mouth scramble, and Tunisia equalised, um, and it finished two two. And oh, it was so just the emotion of that moment. It was you know we'd done so well. Um, you know, and getting a draw against Tunisia in the grand scheme of world football, you know, was a good, was a, was a positive result. But ultimately, you know, we felt we should have won the game. But, you know, for me as a coach, I think our game plan largely worked. I think for the players also, yes, everyone was disappointed that we didn't pick up the three points given the position we were at, especially leading going into the 90th minute. But um, ultimately, the game plan had largely worked. You know, it showed us that what we felt we could do against this powerhouse of African football, um, you know, strategy, 95% correct. And so I think that gave both us and the players real confidence that we could start something. Yeah. And, and yeah, we, we we did. We put in positive performances over those remaining three World Cup games. And then the Federation asked myself and my assistants to stay on, you know, and sign a contract for the African Cup of Nations qualification series. So, yeah, and that was really just the start of the journey. I mean, I'm looking at this. I mean, that was 2013 when you were initially appointed. By 2014, you'd led them to break the FIFA world ranking record so, you know, reaching 50th in the world and 7th in Africa. Now, to put that in perspective, currently now, what, in 2021, Sierra Leone, they're now 114th in the world. So, under your leadership, you know, you broke you broke records, Johnny. I mean, it was something special. Yeah, some could say it might have been a bit of a, um, a hasty decision at parting ways, <laughs> um, given their trajectory ever since. But, um <laughs> No, uh, yeah, look, we, yeah, I think the players all came together. It was an interesting time. Obviously, at the time, the Ebola crisis broke out in West Africa as well. So there was challenges on that. But what we really tried to develop there in Sierra Leone was a real family atmosphere. You know, that, yes, there might be sort of a, a tornado going on around us, but we can only control what's going on inside. And um, and we, you know, look after the things you can control and try and sort of brace yourselves against the things you can't. But yeah. um, and really just, you know, do what we can for each other, fight for each other, work for each other, celebrate with each other. And, and yeah, the guys, you know, we did well and we got into a position where it sort of put us on the map a little bit. And. And yeah, you know, I'm not a great believer in the world rankings. I think it's somewhat of a flawed system. It's different now. They changed how they calculate them a few years ago. So it's a bit more fair. I think back then you could jump up and down a bit too sporadically. But I'll be honest with you, the day those rankings were coming out, I did sort of, I was keeping an eye on my phone um, mm-hmm. to see because I actually thought our, our, our ranking. The record previously, they got up to like 51st in the mid-90s. And in my head, I sort of looked at it and I thought, there is a way to do some calculations on these things. And I thought, going into it, you know what, I think we're going to end up 51. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be level with the previous record. But then when the results came through and we, we got to 50th, you know, it definitely we were pleased in the office. Let's put it yeah. that way. We were yeah. pleased in the office that um, it was just a little milestone for the players and for the staff. And quite rightly, you know, you, you, you touched on that. I mean, you were banned from playing home games due to the outbreak of the Ebola. Uh, Ebola. And that, that to me even probably says how good that achievement was, that you actually weren't able to play home games for much of that period. But 
you know, also, how, how come then the journey came with all this success? How come then it uh, just didn't continue that wee bit longer? Um, look, I think I, I think if I told you or anyone involved in the game that football is an impatient industry, mm -hmm. um, I don't think you would have a lot of debate around it. Yeah. Um, ultimately, we are judged on results um, in the weeks following that. So we, the rankings, and we broke that record early October, and um, we had two away games coming up, one of which should have been a home game, away to the Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm in Abidjan and then away to the DR Congo, mm -hmm. which should have been a home game. And um, we went and we lost 2-1 to Ivory Coast after having led for about 60, 70 minutes of the game. Yes. Um, but two late goals by Gervinho and Wilfred Bonney um, yes. sort of did us in Abidjan. And then we traveled to DR Congo for the second game sort of four days later. And we lost again. It was 0 0 after about 70 minutes, but tired legs set in, and um, we ended up losing 2 0. And look, you lose two games back to back in international football, and, and that's they decided they wanted to go a different direction. Um, again, you look at it, our qualifying group that time round was Ivory Coast, Cameroon, DR Congo, and ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of that qualification series, actually, um, Ivory Coast and Cameroon, or sorry, Ivory Coast and DR Congo qualified, Cameroon and Sierra Leone eliminated, mm -hmm. and Ivory Coast went on to win the Cup of Nations, and DR Congo picked up the bronze medal. Um, so in hindsight, we were basically playing two of the strongest teams in Africa, yeah. and, and it pushed them pretty close, but football is the way it is. Um, and, you know, we lost those two games and they decided they wanted to go a different direction, bring in a different coach. And and look, that's the way it is. You know, you shake hands, you wish them all the best. You know, even to this day, you know, I'm very close with a lot of people in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. and, and look, it's just the way the game is. You sort of accept it. You don't really hold grudges and you move on. Yeah. And, and next on your journey was Uranda then. So, uh, you know, 2016, you led you on to the quarterfinals of the African Nations. And really, that I believe that was the best performance at a major tournament. And you registered your, your, yeah. your biggest ever win as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. We went into Rwanda. It was a very different um, environment to Sierra Leone. With Sierra Leone, it was a team where all of our players were playing in Europe or America. And they were all playing for top clubs, Celtic, AC Milan, um, Malmo, you know, um, Middlesbrough, Bolton, all of these type of teams. And um, so everyone we were picking was playing at a top level in Europe. Whereas we went into Rwanda and probably 90% of the squad were still playing in the Rwandan domestic league. You know, we had our captain was playing in Tanzania. We had our left back was playing in Kenya and we had a centre back playing in Belgium in the second tier in Belgium. But other than that, everyone was playing domestically. So it was a very different environment in that it was a young team. You know, a large number of our team probably could have played for an under-23 Olympic squad. Mm -hmm. and um, But we were hosting the African Nations Championship the following year. So we were qualifying as the home nation. And, and yeah, it was, it was really, it was another pressurized environment because the country were willing to put in the support um, because they wanted to basically shine a real positive light on Rwanda. They wanted to put on a show on the continental sort of stage. And yeah, we went and um, ultimately quarterfinals. Uh, DR Congo again ended up being, you know, sort of the the you know proverbial sort of sort of nail in our thorn in my side. And um, we got to the quarterfinals. Um, we ended up going to extra time and uh, we actually finished that game with 10 men because a player came off injured and we'd already used all our substitutions. And with like three or four minutes to go, we're preparing, we're sort of one eye on penalties and DR Congo score um, and end up going through 2-1 and they go on to win the tournament. Um, so just like in Sierra Leone, where Ivory Coast and DR Congo went on to get gold and bronze, mm -hmm. um, we ended up going out 
as Rwanda in extra time, and DR Congo went on to pick up the gold medal and the trophy. So, yeah. highly, oh, just, you know, just you so know, large all these training. things were. You're, you're probably got your yeah. five names picked for your penalty kick takers as well. Yeah, and it's look, these are the way the games are, and it's you know, um, but it was what it was. Um, we got a lot of positive sort of feedback after that tournament. And um, everyone was quite pleased. Um, yes, disappointed that we'd went out because, as you say, you know, because I genuinely think had we won it again as the home nation, you know, you win it, you go into a semi final. You know, look, every game's different, but DR Congo found their semi final quite, you know, run of the mill. I think we would have also. And then if you're in the final as a home nation, you've got to think your chances of winning the tournament are very high. And so, you know, I'm a big believer that the quarterfinals, the most important game of a tournament, because if you can get past that quarterfinal, you've got a huge chance of winning it. Yeah. You know, um, because in the semifinal, you know, anything can happen. And quarterfinals for me are where that that's the game. If you can get to a quarterfinal and win it, you've got a real chance of winning the trophy. And, um, and it just didn't quite happen. And and look, we all did really well. We came back off the back of that tournament, you know, signed a two-year extension to continue with the team. But then, you know, we get knocked out of, of um, the World Cup and all of a sudden everyone's like, maybe we want to go a different direction again. <laughs> and again, you know, expectation. I, I, but I think the pattern was the same. In Sierra Leone, we raised expectations beyond the level before and yeah. then you maybe get a little knockback and people think oh no we need to make a change to try and continue that initial positive progress yeah without maybe the appreciation that the progress was made together mm-hmm. you know it wasn't made in isolation of the coaching staff it was the players the coaches the federation it was everyone together made that progress your own journey continued. You completed your LMA's diploma in football management in 2019, age 33. And then your next challenge and your next uh, part of your journey then in 2019, you returned to international football. And that was with the Uganda national team. And this is great because you were selected from a pool of 137 applicants. Yeah, um, no, it's Uganda was, it was one of those positions that I, I didn't have it in my head necessarily to return to international football in my immediate future. Mm-hmm. Um, I was enjoying the club environment, but ultimately it was one of those ones that was too good to turn down. Um, you know, Uganda are a strong nation. I knew I knew them and they knew me because I'd obviously been next door in Rwanda. A little bit like leaving being the Scotland coach and then going on to be the England coach. Um, <laughs> you know, Rwanda would be the little brother in the relationship here, no doubt. Yeah. But so they knew. And um, yeah, we had a conversation about what might be possible. And, and together and... And it was, yeah, as I said, it was just one of those opportunities that was too good to turn down, really. Mm -hmm. And was was there much, um, I don't know, I mean, if you put in that example, you know, going from Scotland manager to England manager, you know, doing this in Africa, was there many things from the fans raised eyebrows or anything said negatively or positively? I think there probably was. It helped that a previous coach had done the same journey. Um, so a Serbian coach who I'm actually good friends with, uh, Micho, um, he had done the same journey several years before where he'd previously been the Rwanda coach and then went on to be the Uganda coach. But he actually hadn't done anything in between them. Mm-hmm. He went from one yeah. to the other, um, whereas I had obviously left Rwanda and coached a couple of clubs before coming back uh, to Uganda. So, yes, there were some that traditional rivalry. Um, but ultimately, largely, I think because of the positive results and work we'd done in Rwanda, I thought people in general were very positive about me me coming here and about um, taking up the challenge. And and this was a rule that lasted 18 months, which you registered 67% win record from, from 18 matches. And that was the best return of a Uganda team head coach in over 15 years. 
So, you know, you really do stamp uh, your role and your authority on it and, and, and get results, Johnny. You know, what is it you do when you arrive? What's your style, your formation, your training methods and your mom management? You know, how do you achieve these results? Yeah, I think, you know, this is one of the things that obviously we all develop over time. You know, you try and cultivate, you know, what your approach is. Um, I think, look, I said to you before, before you even get into the football side of it, it's about connecting with people. Um, you know, if you build that relationship and if you if you communicate with people, if you build with them, then, you know, it makes everything beyond that so much simpler and straightforward. But also, I think, being willing to have difficult conversations. Look, nobody likes hearing or delivering bad news, but... I think it's so important to become effective at having what I call the hard conversations and play, people will respect you for it. You know, you don't get to, you got to remember as well here in Uganda that every, it's a bit like, look, when Northern Ireland, mm-hmm. some of the guys who are Northern Ireland, because there's such a small player pool or maybe substitutes at their clubs, you know, so when they come to the international environment, if they end up on the bench for Northern Ireland, if they're already on their bench for whatever team they're playing for in England or Scotland, they probably accept it a little bit more. Calling up guys here in Uganda who have, you know, all 20, 25 of the squad are playing 90 minutes or at least 70 minutes every week for their club side, whether that's in a league in Europe, America, around Africa, they're all playing. So when they come to the international environment, guess what? They expect to play as well. And what you end up having is you have, you know, you've got 10 guys sat behind you on a match day of being on the subs bench. But I think having those difficult conversations with them, being honest about why you've made decisions, accepting that they might not understand your reasoning but you give them the reason anyway, have the difficult yeah. conversation and be honest and upfront with people and, you know, never shy away from that. You know, when, when I was naming squads, you know, always speaking to the people who are going to get left out. You know, if I thought someone might have an expectation to be in the squad, they'd be the first people I'd call that, you know, ahead of any release that they weren't going to be in it. So they weren't surprised by it. Yeah. Um, and and just giving people that respect. I think respect and having hard conversations early, I, I think, you know, does a lot for you long term. And then, look, it comes into, we all, I have a belief in how the game should be played. You know, I have my sort of foundations about how the culture we want to develop. But I always say, you know, you know, I've developed a thing over the years called sort of the, my football house. And I always say to them, I'm like, look, the foundation stones and what this house looks like are largely non-negotiable. And so the external walls and the foundation stones, you know, I'm bringing that. You're hiring me because I'm bringing that. But you know what? What goes on, how we furnish that house inside it is very environment specific. You know, so I have my beliefs and my cornerstones. But then I come into an environment and I go, okay, what players do I have? What are the what are the facilities like? You know, because with all due respect, it's hard to play like Barcelona if your pitch isn't a bowling green. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you've got to, it's hard to play like, you know, Real Madrid if you don't have the top 2% of players in the world. So You've got to come in and you've got your beliefs, but then it's how those beliefs are applied to the environment you find is is really, that's the key part of the recipe. Yeah. And so for me, I think it's about understanding, you know, and also selling them. Look, I've interviewed, I've met with clubs and federations in the past where I've said to them, this is what, if you bring me, this is what you're buying into. I'm not going to serve up something different. And we all have to be agreed ahead of time because if I were to sell them something and then come and do something different, then we're going to run into big problems down the line and it's all going to fall apart. So for me, it's about being very clear from the outset of what my beliefs are and, and how I go about things. 
but also being flexible to say, right, well, when we come in, you know, if the players suit a 4-3-3, three, three, then 3-3. Three, three. Um, if the players we find suit, you know, playing a high pressing game, then we're going to play, we're going to amend our pressing triggers in respect of that. But maybe the team we find, the players there, it would be fall to play a high pressing game that we want to maybe play a mid-block game. And therefore, we amend the pressing triggers in respect of that. But our ability as a team in terms of our positive attacking play, our aggressive defending play, our intense attitude in terms of next, 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 all of these things never change. But exactly how they're applied in the environment has a bit of flexibility. One, one thing, again that I'm probably struggling to understand is with all this success, you know, why did this come to an end after the most successful 18 months that the country experienced in the past 15 years? Was it those expectations then because you set such good level were they expecting too much too soon? Or um, It's hard to know. I, I just ultimately think we got to a point where, look, ultimately... I think in certain environments, there are local factors that sometimes are malleable and other times they're fixed. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think probably in coming in, there was maybe the perception that my cornerstones might be more malleable than they were. Yeah. Um, And ultimately, it was just one of those things that I think... I knew what my non-negotiables were. Um, It turned out down the line that there were certain factors in the local environment in Uganda that weren't going to change, but that, you know, I felt needed to change if we wanted to achieve real lasting success. And, um, And ultimately, I think when you get into that situation, regardless of what's happening on the pitch, it's probably not going to work long term. Um, And so you just come to, like, everyone shook hands, everyone, you know, even like, you know, I've left this role, you know, in, you know, three or four weeks ago. And, you know, but even in the last couple of weeks, I've had a couple of good conversations with the chief executive of the organization. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so it was just one of those things that sometimes you get down the line and, you part on good terms, you understand each other's position. You don't necessarily accept each other's position, but you understand it. And, you know, sometimes the best way to describe it is a relationship. You know, you know, when you're growing up and, you know, you might have, you know, a relationship with somebody and you're both, you know, good people and you both want the best out of it. But ultimately, it's just maybe not the right relationship for either of you. And it's better to to go and try and find the right relationship.